closest philosophy that I can find to the kind of things you're mentioning is the law of attraction. But unfortunately, there is this, uh, you could say, unit or, or curriculum within the law of attraction that says, you know, everything is vibration and the universe cares for you and the universe, uh, you know, they, they kind of animate the universe. They, they personify it. And it, as you say, that is possible. It's a possible ability. Animate is okay. Personify is dangerous. Yeah, I think you run into problems there. And, and, and so to my viewers there, I just want to say, like, you know, you can have your cake and still eat it to some degree. The law of attraction is still the closest thing to the sort of things you're laying out. Uh, but that doesn't mean you have to subscribe to, you know, cosmic consciousness with metacognitive abilities and all of this. And then it just becomes so spooky and, and so on. Maybe actually on that point, what do you what do you think of that with relation to the law of attraction? Because there's a lot of spooky stuff out there. What what of merit is there within within what you've heard? Well, if anything, you can yeah. disagree too. <laughs> yeah. Well, I I think by and large, the universe doesn't respond to our wishes and desires. Otherwise, the world would be a very different place. At least if, if it responded to my wishes, the world would be a very different place. Yeah. Uh, things wouldn't be as bad as, as they are. And they have been a lot worse in the past. Indeed, yeah. Um, so by and large, I think that's the case. I do acknowledge, though, that the moment you say that everything is fundamentally mental, that you do not have a major ontological transition from your inner, ment inner mentation to the universe, they are separate because they are dissociated, but they are not separate in the sense of being of fundamentally different natures. Yeah. Uh, so the moment you eliminate that, that fundamental difference in nature, and you say they both have the same nature, although there is a separation, there is a curtain here, obviously, otherwise the world would be different. Um, but in essence, they are continuous with one another. I, I, look, I'm not going to be precious here uh, and, and, and deny that this opens some doors. Of course, it opens some doors. Um, it, it may be something objective out there responds to, to, to our deeply felt, but not a metacognitively realized um, inner state. Um, if it responded to to what to, to our metacognition, it would be very different. Uh, but maybe it does respond to things we feel, but don't know that we feel. Maybe it responds to things that are sunk deep within our what a depth psychology would call the unconscious mind. What they mean is the non-metacognitive mind. Uh, so I use the word unconscious here between quotes because I don't think anything is unconscious or outside consciousness. So I think it is conceivable that your, your most secret, most repressed, deepest, but most heartfelt inner experiences um, can resonate with your immediate environment. Uh, but if that's the case, then the inner life of all of your fellow humans also is resonating with their common environment. So it's not responding only, only to you, it's responding to everything that has a conscious inner life. So what it does probably will be um, the compound result of what it would do anyway in and of itself, regardless of influences from dissociated aspects of universal consciousness like you and me and my cats, plus the influences, it, subtle influences maybe it receives from the inner lives of all these different little consciousnesses which doesn't leave much room for us to think that we can you know, turn the world into what we want it to be, uh, create our own world, our own life. I, I think the physical world is private, but I, I'm not going to go into that. But there is something underlying the physical that isn't obviously. Uh, the world seems to have an autonomy. Uh, it's, an, it's an obvious empirical observation that the world, you know, I cannot change the laws of nature by wishing them to be different. No, I, absolutely no. not. Otherwise, uh, we wouldn't have gravity. Long ago, 45 yeah. years ago, we wouldn't have gravity anymore if it depended on me. Um, so yeah, I'm open to certain subtle influences. Um, I have experienced them in my own life. I have noticed in hindsight that um, 
some things I was feeling, my, my openness to possibilities sort of tended to influence whether the possibilities would actu actually come or not. When you're close to them, they don't come. But that may not be really a metaphysical thing. It may be just a matter of um, awareness. Like uh, when you're open to possibilities, you pay more attention when they are in front of you. Um, when you're closed, maybe they are still in front of you, but you just don't see them because you're not thinking about them. So I don't know. I don't know. But the only definite answer I could give you is that it is not a definite implication of metaphysical idealism that you can change the world just by wishing it to be different. I don't need it, it. Metaphysical idealism may open a tiny little door for that, uh, but mm -hmm. it's not an implication of it. It doesn't require it. It doesn't imply it. Absolutely. I'm, I'm completely in agreement with that, um, which is another reason why on my channel, I focus so much on, on, um, what would be the word, uh, enhancing your interior life before you try to, you know, um, <laughs> manifest unicorns, you know, <laughs> like, yes, there is, there is a profound amount of, of evidence out there to believe that mental externality is, is a thing that, that thoughts can have, uh, you know, some form of tangible, um, correlation i suppose you would say but uh, you know there's a there's a big gap between that and me closing my eyes imagining a unicorn and then it materializes on my hand like the totally different thing and sadly that is what uh, loa and and you know so many even idealism is made out to be it's straw manned into that and it's very unfortunate um so yeah thanks for for going through that if I can add just one quick comment, I, I want to, to come across a little bit more open than I did <laughs> a moment ago, yeah. uh, because I don't think um, I, I don't I don't think it's the case that there is absolutely nothing to it, nothing to this idea that your inner yeah. state somehow resonates with your environment. I think there is something to it, but it just made out to be a lot more than what we have reason to to believe. I think that. Um, uh, you probably know we didn't talk about it yet. I, I think um, living beings are dissociated mental complexes of universal consciousness. So we can't change the world at will because we are dissociated from it. And the mm -hmm. image of the dissociative boundary is the surface of our skin. That's what it looks like when, on the screen of perception. That dissociative boundary looks like our eyes, our skin, our ears, our sense organs. Um, things that you are metacognitively aware of like um, if, if you're doing affirmations, you know, I want the world to be better tomorrow. You're very cognitively, cognitively aware of that thought because you're repeating it to yourself. You, you, you plan to repeat it to yourself. You're not only experiencing the thought, you know that you're experiencing the thought. Now, these are highly dissociated mental contents. I think they are completely insulated from the world out there. The more attention and metacognition you bring to it, the more in the cairn of your dissociative, the core of your dissociative process, uh, it will be. And it won't influence anything around. I think what might stand a chance of sort of diffusing across the porousness of the dissociative boundary, because as any boundary, a dissociative boundary is not perfect. There is no perfect boundary in nature. Uh, no. Even what we could, you know, at, at the microscopic level, we have quantum tunneling. You know, even if you have a perfect boundary, an electron or a subatomic particle, somehow magically it disappears from one side and pops on the other. Yeah, um, this is a very this is a very real thing. You know, um, I mean, the electronics industry and the high tech industry, it's a big problem for the electronics industry today is quantum tunneling because you're making things so small that we want to contain the electrons in a little bit of metal or a semiconductor. And we can't because they magically tunnel <laughs> across. So <laughs> I no, don't see. Yeah, no boundary in nature is perfect. I don't think our dissociative boundary is perfect either. So I, I am open to the idea that some of our inner experiential contents may diffuse across the porousness of the boundary and influence the world out there. But I don't think those contents would be the ones that you're repeating to yourself because those are highly metacognitive. They are under the microscope of your dissociative process. I think things that you let go of and they sunk in, they, sorry, they sink in and you lose them, they go beyond the field of your self-reflective awareness, they are still 
felt, they are still in the body, as people like to say. No, they, it's in the body, it's not in your mind. They are still in the body, so they are still being experienced, but not metacognitively. And then they may diffuse and they may influence something. So there is something about letting go and letting things go out of the focus of metacognition that I think is the, the most promising, although highly speculative, avenue for thinking about um, influencing the world beyond physical means. Right. Hey guys, did you like this video? You know what to do. And if something I mentioned today resonated with you, click one of them cards on this screen. I have lots of related content sure to interest you. Thanks as always for your views, and we'll see you next time.